The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Panic. Leora had been on his mind all morning. He tried not to think of her tried to throw himself into the office routine, dragged out all the things he'd set aside during the past month, told his secretary they were going to work late. Then, by one in the afternoon, he found himself slipping, letting his mind relax and settle on Leora again. And at three, he discovered he was dictating nonsense to his secretary. At that point, he stopped suddenly and deliberately thought of Leora, of her leaving tonight. Walking out of his life forever. An hour later, he was hurrying out of the passport office on his way to the steamship agency. Yes, sir? Uh, I believe a Mr. and Mrs. Charles Moffat are listed on tonight's sailing. Would you check it for me, please? Of course, sir. Hmm. Midnight sailing, Baratania. Yes, here we are. Mr. and Mrs. Charles Moffat, A-deck cabin 12. Uh, Is there any space left on that ship? Well, as a matter of fact, sir, I have a cancellation right here. I'll take it. The name's Kent Buckley. That's the way it is, isn't it, Kent? You agree to be sensible, to remember that she's married to respectable, wealthy Charles Moffat, surrounded by signs that say, keep off the grass, in big red letters. But it's always been hard for you to be reasonable where Leora's concerned, hasn't it? Yes, Kent. And it's certainly not reasonable for you to be taking the elevator to the 10th floor of the Park Lane Apartments that night at 9 o'clock, just three hours before sailing time, and walking down the corridor to Leora's door. Ken. Leora, darling, I had to come. Charles is back in the study. You've got to go. I don't give a hang where Charles is. I'd just as soon have it out with him right now. I couldn't get you out of my mind. But we agreed to forget it. Did you? No. Neither did I. There's no sense to this, Kent. We're leaving in an hour. That's why I came, Leora. I'm going, too. What are you talking about? I got passage this afternoon. I'm not going to let him take you away. Oh, Kent. Kent, darling. Leora. Mm-hmm. Charles. Hello, Buckley. Go on upstairs, Leora. Charles, please. Get out of here, you two-timing little brat. Wait a minute, Moffat. Did you hear what I said, Leora? Get away from her. You'll find yourself an answer for this one. Oh! Charles! Charles! Stop! Don't hit him again! Oh. All right! All right, Charles! Him. 
You better answer the phone. Yes. Yes, of course. Hello? Oh, yes, the package. I'll call down when it's ready. The expressman's downstairs. Wait a minute. Let me think. I gotta think. Oh, Leora. Leora, please. Oh, what have I done? Ken! Ken, what have I done? Come on, you better sit down. There. Think, think. We gotta get rid of him some way. There's no way. We're on the tenth floor. We got three hours till sailing time. Three hours. We'll never get away. There's no use trying. The baggage. Wait a minute. Leora, where are the steamer trunks? In the study. Come on. Oh, it's no use. Oh, we've got a chance. Whose trunk is this? Charles. His clothes. It's big enough. Yeah. Sure. He's going in it. Come on. Help me get it open. Hello? Just a minute. It's the expressman again. Tell him to come up in five minutes. Oh. Hello? Trunks will be ready in five minutes. Yeah. Yes, please come up. Listen, Leora, you've got to get hold of yourself. Oh. This is going to take nerve. Yes, Ken. All right, now listen. I'm going to leave now. I'll meet you on the pier. The trunks will be sent aboard. Yeah. You and I are going up the gangplank as Mr. and Mrs. Charles but Moffat. They'll check. Not until later. The cabin check comes after we get to sea. Maybe not till tomorrow morning. Ken, it will... It's got to work. You know what happens if it doesn't? Yes, I do. All right, now listen. Your husband's going to commit suicide tonight, right after we sail. He's going over the side. If I'm right about that cabin check, if it doesn't come off till tomorrow morning... But if it does... We'll find a way somehow. i got to go now. Remember, I'll see you on the dock. <laughs> With the prologue of tonight's story, Panic, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. You hear people say there's a reason for everything. Well, there's certainly a reason why, in just 14 years, the Signal Oil Organization has grown from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to almost 2,000 dealers, serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. Briefly, that reason is quality of product. Fourteen years ago, it was Signal Oil Company that introduced the first guaranteed anti-knock gasoline at no extra price. And since then, Signal gasoline has been constantly improved to give you the benefit of every latest development in the automotive and petroleum industry. In today's new Signal gasoline, for instance, the atoms in gasoline molecules have actually been rearranged to create amazing new power. Power that not only helps you enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter anti-knock performance from your car, but also helps you go farther than ever on each gallon of signal. So you see, there's good reason for the swing to signal. Good reason for you to get acquainted soon with the friendly station in your neighborhood displaying signals, familiar yellow and black circle sign. And now, back to the whistler. Kent, you know what panic is now. The blind, paralyzing terror that begins somewhere in your stomach and creeps upward towards your brain. You feel it as you stand on the dock, waiting for Leora, watching the stevedores load baggage, trying to recognize the tan, brass-bound trunk that holds the body of Charles Muffet. You've got his overcoat on, dark glasses, his hat and muffler pulled close around your face. So your features are hardly visible. 
You stand out of the crowd, moving toward the gangplank, waiting. Five minutes. Ten. Then... Kent. Holy aura. Get out of sight, quickly. What's the matter? Hurry. There's no one in the freight office. Come on. What's the matter? She's here. I forgot all about her. Who's here? Alice Merton, the friend of Charles. I just saw her, then I remembered. Kent, she's going too. She's on the same ship. Good Lord, where is she now? Wait a minute. Let me look. Over there. That woman in blue talking to the purser. Oh, yeah. Oh, Kent, if she ever sees you, we're... Wait. She's turning away. Going back to the waiting room. Looking for us, probably. If we can get to the cabin we're in, you can tell her I'm sick, can't see anyone. Well... As soon as I can get away, I'll leave the ship by the visitor's gangplank and come back on board under my own name. Understand? I think so. All right. Let's go. Remember what I told you. I'll do the talking. Just keep calm. Seven twenty-two, right? Tickets, please. Here you are. Mr. and Mrs. Charles Moffat. A deck, cabin 12, right? Here you are. Come on. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, uh, Mr. Moffat. Yes? Uh, I'm awfully sorry, sir. I have a note here about cabin 12. Apparently, the agent made an error. It's been sold to two parties. What do you mean? Well, uh, would cabin 60 be all right? It's on the same deck and it's double. <laughs> yes, that'll be all right. Thanks. Thank you, sir. This way, Mr. Moffat. Right down at the end of the deck. Your hand baggage is down there now. All right, Leora. What about the purser? I don't know. It was dark. He couldn't have seen my face. Oh, here we are. Cabin 60. Oh, darn it. He's stuck again. I'm going to have to have a fix. I keep telling myself. Can't. Shh. Can't look. Leora. Charles, darling. Mrs. Burton. Can't you hurry? This dog's gone key. Yeah, let me try. I can't stop. Hey, look out, let me have that key here. Wait a minute, Charles. Right there. Get rid of her quick. Leora, darling, where have you been? Hello, Alice. Uh, about your trunks, Mrs. Moffat. They're on their way to the baggage room, but I can have Excuse them. me, Leora. I simply must see Charles. Uh, wait a minute. Alice, Charles is quite ill. He's ill? I've got to get below, Mrs. Moffat, if you'll just tell me I'll about I'll talk to you talk. later. Well, I'm sure Charles won't mind it. Please, Alice, please. I said Charles is ill. He doesn't want to see anyone now. You understand? Why, of course. If he feels that way. Okay, I'll send the trunks to the back. I'm sorry, room. Alice. He's been very low lately. I, I'm sure he'll feel better tomorrow. Why, of course. Good night, Leora. Well, that was a close one. Oh, I've got to sit down. Well, what about the baggage? I don't know. I couldn't hear what he was saying. Something about the baggage. We'll have to get it later. I hope they don't make the cabin check tonight. Oh, the shore, it's go to shore. Oh, I gotta get off. The overcoat. Oh, yeah. There. Right, now listen. Forget about the body. We'll get rid of it later. Wait until about three in the morning. Three in the morning. Check the deck carefully. Yeah? Then run out and scream that Charles has jumped overboard. Shoot the works, collapse everything. Oh, Scatter his personal stuff around the room so it'll look like he's been here. Okay? Okay. Yes, Kent. Panic is a terrible thing, isn't it? And it's eating away at you as you leave the ship with the bon voyageurs. As you return and present your own ticket. Then, an hour later, after the ship is pulled out, you discover to your horror that they're making the cabin check. Who is it? Kent, open up, quick. They're making the cabin check right now. Be here in 20 minutes. we got to do it now. That man outside. What, what man? He's hung around here ever since you left. Out there by the rail. Oh. Yes. He's back again. I'll have to get rid of him. You know what to do? I think so. Good luck, darling. I'll wait till he's looking the other way. There. Now. Okay. Nice night. Oh. Oh, you, you startled me. I, I didn't see you. Sorry. Cigarette? No, thanks. I got a cigar here. Uh, Buckley's my name. Grayson. Glad to know you, Buckley. 
Huh? First trip? Well, matter of fact, it is. We'll have a drink on it at the bar down on the next deck. <laughs> no, thanks. I don't drink. Oh. Been over the ship? Yeah. Nice job at that. Well, I was just about to take a walk around the deck. How about joining me? Oh, you better stick around. First is collecting the tickets. Maybe afterwards, huh? Yeah, all right. Mm-hmm. Oh, there they are now. Yeah, yeah, there they I would. Oh, what's wrong? My heart. Huh? Doctor. Hey, good Lord. Purser, Purser. This man's had a heart attack. That was the only way out, wasn't it, Kent? Grayson and the purser carry you down to the ship's hospital, and the doctor examines your heart, then leaves you to rest on the couch. You can almost see the purser now, moving closer and closer to Leora in cabin 60. There's nothing you can do except wait, and your mind takes up the rhythm of the clock. He's at cabin 20 now. 20. Two, twenty-four, twenty-six, twenty-eight, thirty, thirty-two. Man on the board! Man on the board! Man on the board! She made it. <laughs> You race up on deck. The ship is turning around. Searchlights are playing in long arcs across the water. The passengers, officers, members of the crew stand at the railings, trying to see through the blackness. And Leora's on deck outside the cabin, following instructions. Now, Mrs. Moffat. I don't know. I don't know why he did it. He just got up all of a sudden and said he was going for a walk. I looked out the window just in time to see him climb over the railing. I see. That's rather odd, isn't it? Leora. Leora, darling. Oh, Alan. Alistair, I'm so glad you're here. There was something wrong, wasn't there? That's why he acted so strangely a while ago. Uh, pardon me. What's your name, please? Alice Merton. I'm a friend of Mr. Moffat. You would say he was acting strangely? Yes, he was ill. Yes, yes, that's it. He wasn't himself all afternoon. He oh, said he was that, ill. That's hardly a reason for suicide. Uh, I beg your pardon. Yes? Mr. Moffat had every reason for suicide. My name's Grayson. I'm one of his creditors. I see. I took passage on this ship because I suspected he was leaving the country to escape his financial obligations. Oh. I didn't know. Well, I'm I'm sorry, Mrs. Moffat. I'd better take you down to the dispensary, Mrs. Moffat. The doctor will give you a sedative. Oh, this is... There, there, now, now. Everything is going to be all right. Well, that's one important hurdle, isn't it, Kent? But the rest is going to be more difficult. There must be no way for anyone to connect you and Leora to link up your convenient heart attack with Charles Moffat's suicide. You have to take advantage of every moment the two of you are alone together. For example, as you are resting side by side on the beds in the ship's hospital, the doctor goes out for a moment. Did I sound convincing? Wonderful. Grayson was a blessing in disguise. We can take our time now. Yeah, three more nights. Get into Southampton in the morning of the 16th. If that trunk ever gets into customs... Don't even think about it. We've got to be careful. I'm worried about Grayson. I know. Look, I'll be in the lounge tomorrow morning after breakfast reading a magazine. You can come in. Here you are, Mrs. Moffat. Take two tablets tonight and a glass of water. Make you sleep. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Buckley, I'm... Uh... Awfully puzzled about your heart. Oh, it's only happened once or twice. It seems perfectly normal. Strange, isn't it? You see her again the next morning as you sit in the ship's lounge, reading a magazine, back to back with Leora and Alice Merton on the sofa oh, behind I you. I understand, dear. I know it's hard. After all, I thought as much of Charles as you did, but it's not going to help any to sit alone in your room and brood over it. I know it, Alice. I'm going to see the deck steward. Perhaps we can arrange a game of shuffleboard. I'll be right back. Kent. Grayson's been talking to the doctor. Your heart? Yeah, he's beginning to wonder, too. Check the baggage clerk. I'll send the trunk up any time I want it. Good. When? Not till we're ready. You'll have to help me. I can't lift him alone. I know it. Leora, dear, it's all arranged. 
arranged. The steward has it all ready for us. But, Alice, I... Oh, no, no, not another word. That nice Mrs. Broderick's going to join us, and... Uh, oh, let's see. We need one more. How about this young man? Uh, I beg your pardon. Oh. Uh, how do you do? I'm Mrs. Merton. How do you do? Kent Buckley. I'd like you to meet uh, Mrs. Moffat, Mr. Buckley. Oh, how do you do? Hello. Would you like to join us in a game of shuffleboard, Mr. Buckley? Uh... Oh, I'm sorry, not quite up to it today. Uh, perhaps tomorrow. All right, tomorrow. It's a date. Good shot, Leora. Your turn, Mr. Buckley. All right, here goes. Just the deck watches last night. Yes. And women. Uh, here comes another one, Mrs. Merton. All right. Ah, just getting warmed up. We'll do it during the captain's dinner. That's on the last night. Why are we doing it? What are you waiting for? Hurry up. Oh, oh, just a second. It's our best chance. Everyone will be there. Nobody on deck. All right, here's the last one. How's that? Oh, you're too good for me. Another chance. Ah, where'll I get going? Kent, I don't see why. Skip it for now. Look, leave your green purse in the dining room today at lunch. I'll pick it up. My goodness, you two seem to be old hands at this game. Oh, we've just had a run of luck. Kent's never played... Oh, it's Kent, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Buckley. Oh. oh. Well, you're up, Mrs. Merton. Uh-huh. This your purse, Mrs. Moffat? Well, yes, yes, it is. A gentleman found it in the dining room. Thank you very much. Uh, here you are. Oh, thank you. Everyone will show at captain's dinner except deck watches. Get trunk to cabin by 6. Dinner starts 6.30. Watch me and leave when I do. Meet at cabin. Can't. The waiting is the worst part of it, isn't it, Kent? Sitting, wondering what she's thinking. Wondering if she'll be successful in getting the trunk to the stateroom. A whole day of waiting. Then a night and another day. You're 24 hours out of Southampton and the customs. But you were right. Your best chance is during the captain's dinner, attended by all the passengers and officers. No one to worry about except the deck watchers. And you've been careful to note the exact time the watch on the after deck goes down to the galley for coffee. You're at the table in the dining salon at 6.30, seated next to your friend, Mr. Grayson, uh, the man who represents the creditor. I uh, saw you out playing shovelboard yesterday, Buckley. Yeah. Enjoy it? Yeah, great game. A little strenuous. <laughs> you don't mean that. I mean uh, for a man with a weak heart. Oh, yeah. You know, if it hadn't been for that, I might have been able to stop Moffat before he went over the side. Matter of fact, I'd intended to go into his cabin and talk things over with him. That's how I happened to be standing out there on the deck. Well, and then you had to go and pull a heart attack at exactly the right moment. <laughs> <laughs> Always pick the worst time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Almost peculiar the way it happened. Uh, you got a cigarette? Uh, how about a cigar? No, thanks, no. I better get some cigarettes. I'll be right back. That's right, Kent. Make sure Leora sees you leave, then head for the cabin. Once the body is gone, Grayson and the whole lot of them can be as suspicious as they choose. The decks are deserted. Everything is right, isn't it, Kent? Exactly right. Is the trunk in the room? I had an awful time. He didn't want to send us out. Never mind that as a fan. Yes, it's All there. right. We can't be gone too long. Let's get going. Hurry. Don't touch the lights. I'm sorry. Okay. Where is it? It's right over there. <gasps> it's gone. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question. Have you forgotten anything lately? Just anything? Well, of course, we all forget occasionally. But consider what might happen if even one part were forgotten... 
when your car is lubricated. Excessive wear, a damaged part, and your car laid up. That's why your signal gasoline dealer never trusts to memory when he lubricates your car. Instead, he uses Signal's famous check chart, on which the maker of your car shows every lubrication point. And your signal dealer checks each point against this chart not just once, but twice, which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. What's more, your signal dealer uses nine specialized signal lubricants, so each part will have the exact type of protection it needs for long, trouble-free service. This is just another example of the more thorough, conscientious service you get at independently operated signal stations. Another reason why your signal man is a mighty good man to know these days when you really want your car to go farther. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Kent, the panic is back again, isn't it? The blind black panic you felt when you looked down at Charles, dead at your feet back in the apartment. The trunk with Charles' body is gone. Everything. All the planning, the careful meetings, the dodging and lying was useless. The trunk is gone. You forget about caution now as you and Leora hurry down to the baggage room on sea deck and call the clerk to the window. Clerk! Clerk! Yes, sir? What happened to the trunk Mrs. Moffat had sent up to her room this evening? Oh, I'm awfully sorry, sir. Where is it? Well, it seems... Well, come on, where is it? Perhaps the purser can explain. Excuse me, Mackay. Where is it, purser? It was in my cabin at six o'clock. It was an error on my part, Mrs. Moffat. I neglected to inform the clerk. Inform him of what? Of the fact that due to Mr. Moffat's death, we have to impound all his personal effects as a matter of form. What? I'm sorry, Mrs. Moffat. It's simply routine. What do you mean? We'll have to hold the trunk here till we arrive. But it will be available to you after its contents are examined and itemized by the authorities. Uh So, you see, really there's no reason at all to become alarmed, is there? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.